Hey guys, welcome back or to the Wild Courage podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you, Sathya Sam. Thanks, man, for coming on this morning. Thanks for having me here, man. And you pronounced my first name right, too. You nailed it. Way to go. Come on. I was, <laughs> I, I was just telling before we hit record that I was like the most nervous about that. So I'm glad I, I'm glad I, from here, it's going to be smooth sailing. Hey, off to a good start. I, I, um, I got the privilege to marry a couple a couple of years ago, and their last name was really tricky. And I would like wake up in the middle of the night, like freaking out that I was going <laughs> to mispronounce their last name right. And I crushed it. But I practiced like 10,000 times. So That's so funny, man. That's so fun. Well, yeah. I was telling you, I've heard every mispronunciation of my name, with, like with the name like Sathya, you can imagine. And the funny thing that happens now with my name, I shouldn't say now, this has been going on for a long time. But if people don't meet me, like they don't actually see me physically, but they just hear about, you know, someone's friend Sathya or whatever then they just assume I'm a girl because oh. it kind of sounds like Cynthia or Sophia. Yeah. And so then people are like, oh, you're, you're a dude. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sophia. Right. Sweet. Okay. Got it. You know, so that's yeah, awkward so. at the coffee shop when you're meeting somebody you don't know for coffee and they're like, whoa, I didn't. Okay. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it's 2023 awesome. too. So, you know, some, now people are like, oh, well, I guess that makes sense in a lot of different ways. You know, <laughs> that's awesome. Do you know where yeah. your name came from? Yeah, yeah. So my parents are both East Indian. Uh, okay. It's part of my story, which we'll get into, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, it's an East Indian name. It, it means truthful one. Oh, come on. I How know. How beautiful not bad, is eh? that? That's yeah. awesome. And you were yeah. telling me you're, you were born and, and raised in Canada? Yeah, I'm born and raised in Canada. My parents are born in, in, in India. So they're, they're, uh, they were immigrants and I'm a first generation Canadian. Oh, nice. And where do you live now? I live in a city called St. Catharines, Ontario. I'm about an hour from Toronto, 25 minutes from Niagara Falls. Oh, okay. So you're just straight north of New York. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Just like, I mean, I'm like 45 minutes away from Buffalo. We just crossed the border and Buffalo's right there. I Is it true? I saw a thing on the History Channel once that there's a town that was right on the border and they restructured and the town got split by the Canadian and American border. And in the in the... In this documentary, like the library, you have to have a passport to get from one side of the library to the other because when they redid the line, it split the library. That's hilarious. Well, yeah, there, there's a there's a little um, like dual town called Queenston Lewiston, and one side's on the Canadian side, one side's on the American side. I didn't know about the library thing though. That's kind of cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, yeah. we we have a mutual friend in Seth Dahl, so we got to say thanks to Seth for setting this up. He. He's good at putting people together. He's always doing that. He's like a sneaky little guy running around, <laughs> like getting people together. I love that guy. Yeah. And he's, he has raved about what you're doing, Jeremy, like far beyond the podcast. You have some incredible things going on. So I, I just feel super privileged to be here today. Oh, thank you, man. It's been super fun to have Seth kind of be a part of this and come to our retreats when he can. That guy's so busy, but um, yeah, it's, he's such a, been a huge blessing to us and what we're trying to do and championing us and yeah it's great he's amazing i love that guy yeah cool so let's let's i thought we'd do it a little bit backwards like i'm just blown away by the work you're doing so let's jump into that first and then maybe after you kind of give us the hundred thousand foot view of what you're up to and this mission that you're on then let's kind of jump back into your story and like how did you get to where you're at today? But let's start with the end part of what you're doing today first. Yeah, so I'm a porn addiction recovery coach and nobody gets into this line of work without their own experience, which we'll definitely dive into. <laughs> you don't uh, go I'll to say, school for it? <laughs> no, you don't. And when you ask a kid what he wants to be when he grows up, he never <laughs> says a porn addiction recovery coach. So um, yeah, so there's a story there. But I basically, I work with uh, professional Christian men and I really help them get to the roots of their addiction. I think a lot of those solutions in the addiction space, but certainly in uh, porn addiction or anything related, uh, a lot of them are more along the lines of like uh, behavior modification. And my interest is really in transforming the heart. And so, um, so that's that's kind of the, my my line of work. Um, I'm really heavy on the media side, so I've released a book. Um, you know, very wow. active on social media, interviewed on national TV, promoting what we do and trying to spread awareness about the harmful effects of pornography. And um, that's, yeah, that's kind of the nature of my work in a bit of a nutshell. Wow. How long have you been like doing this full for a living? 
So I've been doing this for a living for about four years. It started uh, as a side hustle. Um, I was a little bit miserable in my nine to five. And then uh, about two years ago, it was July 2021 is when I made the leap to do it full time. Nice. Yeah. And when you say professional, like you help professionals, what what is like your your clientele is mostly... Yeah, it's kind. Of, yeah, that, that's what I mean. Is like we we seem to be the most effective with people that are you know twenty five to forty five. They're either getting their career started or they're starting to advance in their careers. That just seems to be when like crap hits the fan, quote unquote. And it seems to be just when we're the most impactful in people's lives. So we worked with a lot of accountants, engineers, doctors, other health professionals. Uh, worked with a couple of athletes and that kind of thing as well. So it, across the board, but that's what I mean when I say professionals. Is it primarily men at this yeah, point? I mean, Are you focused work only on men? Yeah, I work yeah. exclusively with men, but I it, it is worth noting that like this is not a, exclusively a male issue. It's just that this is just my lane. But I mean, women are struggling, and they they deserve just as much help as the guys do. Yeah, this is you. You've just found your favor in in this line of work. Yeah, good your way little, of putting it. Your sweet spot. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I love this thought of. I was talking with a buddy the other day about like you can learn a lot from reading a reading books and going to college, but there's a different authority that we carry if we've actually walked through something. Mm. Like my my one buddy says, like if you never trust a man that doesn't walk with a limp and smell like smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard the smell like smoke part. I like that. So like to have the authority that you do and the insight, you've really sat in this and put yourself through it because mm. if you don't it's head knowledge yeah and we've all sat under people that read about it and learned something and not that you can't learn something from then but man to sit with somebody that's done the hard work and has a limp and does smell like smoke and been to hell and made it back they just carry a different weight in their authority in whatever it is they talk about so that's mm. how i view you as like when i've seen you on social media and your podcast, I'm like, oh, this guy, he carries an authority in this lane because there's a huge story behind why you're so gifted in this one lane, especially. Yeah. And I, I mean, for me, you know, I'm trying to be the person that I wish I had in my life when I struggled, you know, because I think the issue is taboo and it does take a lot of bravery or boldness or whatever you want to call it to actually put your story out there it doesn't feel that way anymore it, it did when i first started now it's pretty normal but um but yeah i just know that you know the more i can get my story out there hopefully the more guys realize there's hope for them as well exactly that's how i felt with my sexual abuse like women have done a pretty good job about being open about that and talking about it and i was like <clears throat> i've found so much healing it used to cost me a lot more to tell my story right mm. And the more healing that you I've received, the easier it is for me to be transparent about it. It used to be extremely vulnerable, and now it's more just being transparent because I've I've received so much healing in that area that I I'm not afraid to talk about on bigger platforms where it used to be like, man, if anybody ever knew about this, right? The shame that's involved in all of that is so crippling. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I know for me, like I think all the stuff that I feared if I were to share my story, like that my friends would think differently of me, I'd lose my reputation. You know, you start to realize like these things are just silly. They don't, they're they're not real. And uh, typically it's the other side. Like people have more respect for you. Your friendships get stronger. And yeah, there's tons of benefits on the other side of vulnerability. It just takes a little bit of a mountain to climb first to get there. Exactly. Yeah, the fear is like if they real if you really knew me, I knew what was inside of me. There's no way you could like me, let alone love me. And then that hits on everybody that's ever dealt with any rejection or abandonment, mm -hmm. right? And it just mm -hmm. doubles it down. And the truth is, to your point, every time I've taken risk and been vulnerable with not like on here, but with people that I trust, it's just met with compassion. Yeah. And that, and, and there's something about shame that can't live inside of vulnerability like they they're they're like reverse magnets they both can't occupy the occupy the same space right yeah so yeah i've found that the more vulnerable i am with the people that i trust in my inner circle 
the more healing it brings because shame can't coexist with vulnerability. And it's always met with compassion. That's the lie that we believe on the other side of it, right? Is like, man, if you ever knew me, if you really knew, there's no way you could like me, let alone love me. That's Mm. the fear, I think, that keeps us from getting healing and vulnerability. And we see it in our fires here in the barn with guys that are like struggling with this. And they're just met with tears of compassion from guys who've been there before. And that's oh, what's yeah. so powerful about, I think, what you're doing and getting that message out there. So with that, what's your story, brother? <laughs> okay, so you, you'll have to pause me or interject if there's certain points you want to ask more about because uh, there's a lot to this. I'll, I'll try to set the stage. So I mentioned that my parents were immigrants. I'm a first-generation Canadian. Uh, my dad is a third-generation pastor. So... My grandpa, Double shame. My great, yeah, <laughs> yeah. My grandpa and great grandpa were pastors as well. So, uh, all of that is to say is like we didn't talk about sex in the house, and there was sort of this unspoken expectation that you're perfect, and if you fall short, hide it. So, like, don't bring shame to the family, don't embarrass us, and at the same time, you know, it'd be like, oh, you got ninety eight percent on your test. That's amazing. What happened to the other two percent? You know, like yeah. it was it was always that kind of thing. And I don't I don't want to paint my parents in the wrong light. They were amazing. They were not like tyrannical parents, but there were just some cultural dynamics at play, both from a religious perspective and an ethnic perspective that, you know, played into the the environment I grew up in. So the home was safe. Uh, there was not any like major trauma um, as far as like traumatic events or whatever. My parents were the same people off the stage that they were on the stage, which oh, not nice. a lot of pastor's kids yeah. can say. Uh, so very fortunate that way. Um, and my parents were even like, you know, they sent us to Christian schools and all that. So like we, we had a, a a good upbringing. Everything was more or less set up for us to make pretty good decisions in life. And I got exposed to pornography in the computer lab of my Christian school when I was 11 years old. So that's where this story really begins. And it was just a friend of mine. He, he came over to me. He was like, Hey, my buddy said to check out this website. I think he already knew what it was. I don't, I don't know. Um, it was a very innocent sounding website and I punched it in and lo and behold, like I was looking at something that I, I I had no comprehension for. Um, the other thing that's probably worth mentioning is that I skipped a grade. And the reason that's relevant is because as glamorous as that may sound academically, from a developmental perspective, mm, younger, you're always yeah. a year behind. So my friends, and my friend who, you know, would have, um, I guess, given me the website URL and all my other friends were like, you know, they were hitting puberty, right? They're like 12, 13 years old and I was 11. So uh, that makes sense. Even, yeah, even a discrepancy there, right? And so for me, I was I was kind of mortified by what I had seen. I was pretty sheltered and didn't didn't really understand it. Obviously intrigued by it. It's not like I was completely disgusted. But I was definitely like a little bit disturbed and didn't really understand what that was. And it's not like I went home and I suddenly became an addict. Like it didn't happen overnight. I, it was probably eight, 10 months later that I was, you know, starting to enter puberty. And then I started to remember that site. Like my curiosity kind of connected with that previous moment. And that's when things started to sort of head in that direction. So by the time I was in high school, I was watching pretty regularly. Uh, it was kind of normal amongst my peers as well. And again, I had a conviction about it. I knew that I probably could do better, that maybe I should stop. Kind of just told myself I'll quit one day when it matters more, you know, that kind of thing. And then university is when it 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 was the worst. That was kind of my my lowest moment as far as my struggle goes. And I can get more into that, but I don't know if there's anything you want to ask around that first. No, it's just interesting to me that addiction how it's such a slow burn. Oh, it's yeah. like you wake up one day, like I had a few beers in high school. I got drunk a couple times, but I grew up the same way you did, conservative Christian home. And I knew the difference between right and wrong. Hmm. And I'm I'm obviously a lot older, so like it was Playboy magazines. It wasn't, you know, the yeah. internet. There was no internet when I was in high school. It was just yeah. barely coming out. So but it, it is it is this like slippery slope of like, well, it's not that big of a deal. I can manage it, right? Like yeah. I can turn this thing off whenever I want. And then you're 23 and there's no stopping it. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter well, if it's porn or whatever, you know, beer, whiskey, whatever. It yeah. Is, it is a slippery slope. That's it. That was exactly my story. Like I was 20, 20 years old or 21 years old. 
And, you know, I was like planning my days around it, like, like had some really big mm -hmm. indicators that this was like a pretty deep seated problem. And um, even though I grew up in the church and my dad was a pastor, um, I went through like a bit of a faith crisis when I was in university. I was studying biology. My plan was actually to become a psychiatrist at the time. I'd lost a bunch of friends to suicide in high school and really had a fascination with mental illness and, and mental health, you know, wanting to make things better in that arena. And in my sort of faith crisis is where I really committed my life to, to the Lord and, and became a Christian and all that. And I knew, I knew what came with that decision. I knew that, you know, I had to stop drinking irresponsibly. I knew that I had to clean up my language and I knew I had to stop watching porn. And so it was like, okay, well, you know, we're doing it. And so, you know, in a couple of weeks, I mean, I could, I could just have one drink and be done with the night. That was fine. Uh, I could clean up my language, not a big deal. I could not for the life of me stop watching pornography. You know, I could maybe go a couple days if I was lucky. And that, that's when I started to realize, oh, all those things I told myself of like, I can quit when I want. It's not that big of a deal. Everyone's doing it, but you know, whatever. Suddenly I was realizing, oh no, I was horribly mistaken. This is actually a very deep seated problem. Yeah, that's, it's just listening to you talk about is like my same exact journey with alcohol. Hmm. Like the planning your day around it. Like I knew how much I could drink before noon and how much I could eat and not kill <laughs> the buzz and how much to land the plane so that I could finish off blacked out, but still function and keep my job. And like, wow, it's amazing the who the hoops we jump through to feed that thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And how strategic yeah, and, and smart we get. And it's like, oh, I didn't know I was so creative till I became an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that I could really like be that, uh, have that much um, thought into the whole thing. I was extremely creative, like you're saying. Yeah. Like it's amazing. Yeah. And, and, and again, even the creativity is not it rarely happens overnight, right? It's just, it's a gradual pro like progression. And then one day you just find yourself trying to creatively get that next hit or that next drink or, you know, that next site or whatever. And then that, that's when you're really forced to like, I guess, I mean, for me, I, I know I became very aware of like, dang, I'm, I'm actually pretty broken. And I'm also like very hopeless because I think that was the scary part was like, I don't, I don't have it within me to handle this problem. That's a scary place to be. Because mm -hmm. like I said, like the drinking, like for me, that was no problem. And and that was such an empowering feeling of like, oh, this is great. You know, I'm drinking responsibly. I feel like I'm living aligned with my beliefs and my value system. It was just terrifying and kind of debilitating to be like, wow, I I, I don't I don't even know what you do when you can't stop watching porn, you know? And uh, like you were talking about how for, for you as Playboys and then, you know, there was like the CD room in the back of the blockbuster and then, you know, then there's the internet and then there's smartphones. And for me, I was, I was pre smartphones when, when most of my journey took oh. place, it's a completely different animal now, but all, all I could find online when I was looking for help was like install an internet filter and, you know, try to talk to somebody about it. And, you know, maybe in the more religious circles, you would hear like, read your Bible more, pray more. Uh, there'd be kind of a spiritual disciplinary element to it. The old, uh, the old white knuckle it. Yeah, 100%. Very hard for a brown guy to do, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so it, it was, it was just, you know, it was a lot, it, it was a lot of surface level. Let's try to, let's try to hack this weed with a lawnmower rather than mm. getting to the root of it and actually resolving it once and for all. So that was kind of how my journey in recovery started, you know, because I was genuine and like, I want this thing out of my life. I wasn't going to let the hopelessness defeat me too badly. And I kind of just spun my tires for a couple of years. You know, I don't know if this was any part of your recovery story, Jeremy, but, you know, for me, it was like you, you go a week and you kind of psych yourself up a bit and it's like, yeah, we got this. And, you know, pro this feels different. You know, I don't know what it is. Something feels different, man. And then, you know, two weeks, three weeks, you find yourself binging again. Um, I was kind of in that that binge purge cycle for for a, a solid couple of years, which is typically where you land when you try to modify behavior. You can you can kind of stave off the urges and the temptations for so long, but you're you're just one weak moment away from relapsing and falling back into it. Yeah, that's that's exactly my experience. I could white knuckle sobriety for a month. Yeah, and then this is interesting to me when I would 
because it's really circumstantial, right? As long as the weather was just right and my marriage was just right and I was having just enough sex and the job was going good and all my relationships were intact, I could white knuckle it. But right. the first stormy day in in any of those aspects and I would be in the alley of the liquor store banging on the steering wheel, God, please don't mm. let me take this from me. I don't want to go in here to doing it. The shame really kicked in the next day because I'd be like, well, I already blew it yesterday. So what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. Like my month is gone. There's this stigma about the calendar with sobriety, right? Yeah. That that's the race we're against or that's, 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 that's the tail of the tape, if you will. It's yeah. like, how long you been sober? Well, I made it a month and then we slip one day and then we think it's back to zero. And so right. it's hard to create any momentum around sobriety in any of these addictions, right? When that's the way we think about them. Yeah, I tell guys now all the time, like, you're not going back to zero. You had six months of clean <laughs> living and doing the right things, and you had you had a, you stubbed your toe. It's yeah, okay. you're not going yeah. back to zero. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. For me, the shame of that was really if I blew it one day and then it was like, oh, screw it. I might as well drink again because I already, you know, ruined it. So I don't know if that was your experience at all. Street counting is the greatest symptom of behavior modification, like the sort of external <clears throat> mm. try to sweep it under the rug, try to just get clean as quickly as possible. So I'll give you an example. This this happened to a guy in our community recently. And this is to me, this is like a much healthier view of it. So he did, he did this post in our community and he was like, hey, I just want to give people an update. He was four months in to our program and uh, which is kind of like the first leg of our program. So um, he was like month one, I had 23 slips. Month two, I had 20 slips. And at that point, you know, if you hear those details, you're like, man, your program sucks, right? Like, <laughs> like, why is this guy doing your program? You I know, want my like, money back. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So then uh, month three, eight slips. And in month four, five slips. Come on. So what we tell people is it's not about counting streaks. It's about monitoring the trends. You want to track the trend. And if the trend is going in the right direction, then we can be pretty confident that as long as you keep doing the things you're doing that are facilitating that progress, it's only a matter of time. So oh, I actually, I, I took a screenshot of it and I posted it on Instagram. Uh, he gave me his permission, obviously. And, um, and I just, I, I asked my followers, I just said, um, this is where, uh, his name is Jameis. I said, this is where Jameis is in month four. Where do you guys think he's going to be in month six? Come on. You know, like, like you don't have to be a mathematician to put two and two together here. Right. And then sure enough, like, I think it was month six or month seven. He had done another post. Uh, again, uh, no, like no facilitation or prompting from me, but he had just hit like 50 days clean and, and da, da, da. like the rest is kind of history. Like he's like in 90 or hundred days now. But this is what happens when you take a more internal approach. It's slower on the front end. It's very easy to get into that place of like, what the hell am I doing? This doesn't work. Why, you know, why did I ever sign up for this? But if you can stick it out and you can really actually do the work required to get to the more in uh, underlying inner issues, then eventually you start to make progress and the trend starts to go in the right direction. And to me, that's a much healthier approach to uh, what I would call freedom. I would say that's the difference between freedom and sobriety. And uh, when you really pursue freedom, this is kind of the, the trajectory you can expect. That's amazing. Um, you clearly, to walk this out personally, had to go after some roots of yeah. Because the question that I propose to guys all the time is, why do we do the things that we do? Whatever it yeah. is, right? Because yeah. it can be whatever unprocessed pain that we sweep under that rug that we're not dealing with, it's showing up somewhere. Yes. And for some, it's eating. For some, it's um, really successful guys that you probably bump into a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Like that thing isn't drinking but it's high performance it's eating it, mm -hmm. it it can show up so i think there's some generalities in this whatever your pain is and however it's manifesting is the answer is is going back and asking yourself why do i do the things that i do why does this trigger me in a way that makes me want to find relief because yeah. really, porn 
leads to masturbation, which leads to some sort of, and there's all the science behind what it does to our brains and the chemicals and endorphins. But man, the trick with, at least when I got drunk, it would last for a long time. Mm -hmm. With porn, it's like such this little tiny shot that like, it's never enough. Oh like yeah. You can you can get drunk enough to where it just you'd fall down and fall asleep, right? And yeah. porn's a kind of different monster. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So porn addiction in its simplest form is an intimacy disorder. And porn is fast food intimacy. Mm. So it might temporarily satisfy but it's really only a matter of time before the cravings come back. So when people are tackling the roots of the issue, that's like language we use a lot, and I've heard you use it as well, which I love. Um, We find that most of the roots fall into three categories. Now, again, this is definitely an overgeneralization. There are incredible individualities to this whole subject, and I I don't want to negate those, but to at least give your listeners an idea of where to start. The first is what I would call emotional dysregulation. So this is the inability to cope with stress properly. This is the inability to get your needs met in healthy ways. This is a lack of understanding of the inner life. And um, when you lack understanding, we, we kind of have this saying in our community, if you are not aware, it cannot be repaired. Mm, that's good. So, it, so if you don't actually understand why, why the problem exists, what are the thoughts, m- emotions, the circumstances, the perceptions, um, if you don't really know those things, you're kind of in the dark. And so that's the first bucket. The second is, the, the easiest word to use is trauma. People know what that means, but it's more than just trauma. It is, um, it's uh, relational dynamics from your childhood. It's unforgiveness, it's bitterness, it's resentments. It's sort of all of these things that serve as blockages from our heart actually changing. And, um, and so the, the, the important thing here is that he who is most vulnerable heals the quickest. Mm, that's so it, good so yeah so this is where like the rubber really meets the road it's like okay if you maybe you've worked through some of the emotional dysregulation you also need to figure out what are the blockages here and the more vulnerable you are as we go through this process probably the quicker the more quickly you're going to heal but some of that comes from i've found in my journey and story is being honest about our childhoods we do this thing where we protect our parents and like you and i talked about early before we started yeah um, no, you talked about early on in this podcast is my parent, my parents were awesome. They did the best they knew how with the tools they had. Yeah. And there's divorce and, you know, I lived with my dad my mom was gone, not because my mom was bad, but the lack of having that nurturing mother in my life that showed up in my relationships as I got older. Right. Yeah. And and so some of that intimacy, the lack of intimacy that you're talking about, I have found in my again my journey has created why I needed to feel like I needed to have sex with so many women because I was always searching for that intimacy. Yep. And and it doesn't mean my mom was bad. Yeah. <laughs> it just means that is that the vulnerability like in our story of going back and being vulnerable of like Okay, the reality is I grew up essentially without a mom. Mm-hmm. And when I did have moms, they weren't the good kind. Mm-hmm. That there was no nurturing, right? So yeah. I've saw that that and again, my story, that's where women really I tried to make a part of my healing journey in a very unhealthy way. Right. And it showed up in my marriage, obviously, too, before I got some healing but is that kind of the intimacy where some of this can kind of start oh yeah 100 percent. this is this is exactly it it's trying to get to the origins of some of these dynamics like when you build self-awareness and you you work through some of the emotional dysregulation you might realize like man anytime that i uh you know don't meet a deadline at work anytime that i feel like i'm performing inadequately um or not showing up that seems to be when i'm the most triggered it's like, well, that's interesting. I wonder why that's there. And that this kind of like second stage of it, of getting through the traumas is where you might start to understand why. You might try to understand where this actually originated. So yeah. yes, absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. That's good. I just wanted to, yeah, 
for you to go there just because I think that so many times we we get so protective of the childhood of mom yeah. and dad. And I love, and I've said this on here before, but I love the the Bible says that we're to honor our parents, our mom yeah. and our dads, but we're not, that doesn't say that we're supposed to lie about the reality of the scenario and situation in which we grew up in. A hundred percent. Yeah. And it's not dishonoring, to be honest. It doesn't mean that you blame them for everything. I've found so much compassion for my parents in, in going on this journey yes. of understanding, man, they didn't have it good either. And they did a much better job than their parents. And it just is an invitation for compassion for our parents. It's not about shaming them and beating them up and any of that, but it's just about the truth and the honesty of, of how we grew up. Yeah, for sure. I'm I'm personally, I'm veering away a little bit from the use of vulnerability these days, the use of the word, just because it's become so mainstream. And anytime something becomes mainstream, you always risk that. Well, first you risk the dilution of the concept, uh, or you risk that people pursue it for social reward instead of the actual reward. And right. so um, we, we've observed that not a, not a ton in our community, but a little bit. And it's like uh, people being vulnerable and like sharing, airing their dirty laundry in the name of vulnerability. And it's like, no, that's not the point. Um, we, we use the word transparency. And I think this has a good relevance for what we're discussing, because I think if you're transparent about how your parents treated you and, and, and what that experience was like growing up, it should encompass the good the bad and everything in between, right? That's right. And I I think sometimes people's pursuit of vulnerability surrounding those things, they tend to highlight the negatives typically because they've kept them hidden. So rightfully so, like that's very liberating to be able to discuss those things in an open forum for the first time. But I think transparency is what actually keeps them in their proper context. Because if all I told you was like, for me, it was like growing up feeling neglected by my mom, even though my mom was always present and always like very loving and supportive. The way she showed love was not really the way that I felt would feel loved. Um, she's a bit more timid and shy. And so because of that, that's why I started to seek out pornography because it was like, this is awesome. I'm getting all the attention and feelings of being wanted, uh, all the stuff that I wasn't getting uh, at home, so to speak. But if that's all you know about my mom, you start to get uh, actually a very inaccurate picture of what's going on. And so I think transparency gives, uh, you know, it gives you the good and the bad and hopefully a well-balanced view because this is not about throwing stones at our parents, you know, and it's not no. about, um, it's not about that at all. Um, it's really just about talking about everything, you know, in, in equal levels of transparency, um, so that you can reach that place of healing. Yeah, that's really good. I I've also found, and I'd be interested to see if you found this true in your areas of what you're doing, but if you're not careful with the parent thing, you, I've seen people easily become a victim. Yes. It creates yes. a victim hood mentality and you're like well you just start blaming it on your parents and there's no ownership of okay this <laughs> happened to me it wasn't my fault so i'm going to have some self-compassion i'm gonna have compassion for my parents but how i react and respond to it now that i have the knowledge is on me like mm. i have to i have to engage with my behaviors and yeah. not just throw my hands up and be like, well, if my mom loved me the way I needed to be loved, this wouldn't have happened. <laughs> and I I think in this language, like you're talking about with vulnerability and as is, is it's becoming more aware, I see I see it trending more that way than ownership. I'm yeah. like, yeah, this happened to me. I was sexually abused, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like compassion, compassion. But it, it also created this person that didn't treat people the right way and was manipulative and to get what I wanted and that I need own. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think um I think millennials are notorious for this. I think we're somehow under this illusion that like, oh, if if only my parents were perfect, then my life would have been perfect. Yeah. And it's really just not how it works. And and I think on the other side of it as well, like people sometimes just dive way too deep into their past as well. And and it becomes this like big like bigger than it needs to be and obviously there's a bit of a balancing act here but like for me what i always encourage my clients is i'm like we look at our past long enough to learn and that that should be the intent is like we're trying to learn we're trying to discover and once we've gone outside of those confines that's when i think we tend to veer off more into the destructive elements of vulnerability or digging into your past or whatever it may be yeah that's really important it's it's necessary to go back there, but not to live back there, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And to get healing and then move on. Yes, 
That, exactly. I see people, you, I'm like, you got healed from in that area. Why are you still there? Why are you hanging yes. out there? That's exactly like, it. Let's keep trucking here. There's yeah. there's things to go do and other areas to explore of deeper connection with God and and deeper healings in other areas. And they get honed in on one thing. And it's like, there's so much more available. Keep going. <laughs> yes, exactly. So that that's why for us, just to com- complete the answer to this question, the other category I would say of like root issues would be somebody's belief system, how they view themselves, mm. um, you know, how they view God if they're coming through a, a Christian lens, uh, how they view others. And what what I've observed is that all behavior or most behavior is rooted in belief. And so if you can really help people tackle their faulty thinking, the faulty belief systems, the lies they're believing. Like I'm not um, worthy. Yeah, exactly. Not good enough. Is that enough. a big one? Yeah. What are, what are some of the big areas in that okay, belief so, system that um, I, leads to that? Yeah, I'm not good enough. Um, I'm not lovable. Hmm. Uh, if you really knew me, you would reject me, what we were talking about earlier. Um, those are probably the three most common ones, at least certainly the three that come to mind right away. Um, again, there's there's tons of nuances to this, so I don't want to pigeonhole people too quickly here. Sure. But but that would be um, that would be the main thing. And our our goal, like when somebody's working through this part or this bucket, um, our real goal is helping people get to a place where they're confident enough to be themselves that they would risk rejection for it. Oh, so the way we say That's it is good. Like uh, like my statement is like I would rather be. 100% my true self and rejected than 80% my true self and accepted. Wow. So it's, it, you're trying to build this bold authenticity that it's like that people are so comfortable in their own skin, they would feel uncomfortable outside of it. And that's it, so good. It takes work to get there, but this is sort of the inevitable byproduct when you work through the emotional dysregulation, you've cleared some of the trauma and some of the blockages and you've embraced that transparency vulnerability thing. Um, inevitably, you're going to start to become the person that God's made you to be at, at a completely different depth. And once yeah. once those things are taken care of, it's hard to imagine you staying the same person, you know. And and for us, we just know that if enough activity, well, let me be more clear: if enough improvement happens internally, it's only a matter of time before the behaviors and everything that accompanies it takes care of itself. Yeah, that's. That's so good because how much of us is operating in our false self? Yeah. Like I look back in, in my full blown brokenness and I'm like, man, I was really trying super hard to be somebody that I'm not. And to keep yeah. up with that was exhausting. Yes. And over the last 13 years that I've been on my journey, um, it's fun to be more comfortable in my own skin and be honest with myself in areas for the first time. Mm. And we've all know somebody who's super authentic. And again, it's kind of like the shame thing of like, if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. Mm. I'm finding the opposite to be true. Starting with my wife. Guess what? (laughs) She likes the authentic me. Yeah. My friends, they like the real me, not the persona that I tried to chase my whole life. And it's such a part of the healing process that now I get to be authentic and I get to be me and I don't have to apologize for it. And I don't have to worry that it's going to hit with everyone. Yeah. And it's okay. Yeah. Well, I think this is why, like, this is really hard for guys. Um, It's hard for everybody. And, uh, you know, the female experiences has its own challenges, I think for guys, it's really hard though. You know, it's hard to actually find these places. This is why I love what you're doing, Jeremy, like the retreats and the fires and, um, you know, this podcast, like you're creating spaces for guys to do this safely. And that's the most important thing. Um, I I remember one time, uh, this was when I was working before I had started doing my business full time. And um, the CEO of our organization was, you know, he's casting some vision for the year ahead. And, um, and he was like talking about like, you know, goals for the company. And then he used a personal example 
Um, and he was like, he's like, for example, for me, like I'm trying to lose 70 pounds this year. And he was, he said something to the effect of like, how's that for being accountable or something like that, you know, as if like, you know, and I was like, that's absolutely nothing for being accountable because an environment like this is not actually conducive to any kind of facilitation of that goal. Like that's just like a weird humble brag or vulnerability for the sake of some social points, not for your actual development. And so I think for the space you've created is so immensely valuable for your listeners and the people that you're working with, because when you find these environments that are actually safe, where you can actually explore these parts of you and you're like this guy on my right, he gets it. This guy on my left has already been here. Jeremy, you understand you're not going to judge me. Um, that becomes to me, it's like one of the most valuable assets a man will have in the 21st century because mm. we are living in this illusion that we're more connected than ever before when really we're lonelier we're more depressed and we're more disconnected probably than we've ever been in the history of time and i think um i think that's that's sort of the clincher in all of this is like for you to actually do these things well and walk in some of the freedom that we're discussing it requires that environment of safety where there's little to no risk of being judged and losing your reputation, whatever else. And those places are really rare for, for men, I would say. Yeah. It's, and that's what we're seeing for sure on the fire. There's no phones and it's dudes sitting around oh, the fire. Come on. Like yes. there's something ancient about it that it it's bridging the gap between generations of this in both ways, this is the beautiful thing, and I, I got to be somewhat vague to protect what happens in that space. But yeah, for a young man who's fought the this fight with with addiction, with porn addiction, and has had some breakthroughs and healing in it, going after the root causes, and then for the older guy who is in his sixties, seventies, who's a sage, who's been giving us all marital wisdom and just uh, passing on his um, things he's learned in his journey to see what this young man's going through and the humility to say with tears in his eyes, I'm struggling with porn. Can you pray for me? Can you help me? Mm. And it's mind blowing to see how in this space that you just described, what we're seeing happening with people three generations apart yeah, and crossing those bridges to offer support and validate their pain. And it is incredible and, and it is healing and it's the beginning. It's the beginning. You got to start somewhere. Yes. Um, yeah. But you said something I'd like to circle back to about this time we're living in now because of social media and the phones and all the things we feel like we're super connected, but porn has never been more rampant. I don't know any statistics because it's not really my lane, but it's the opposite, right? We're the least connected, like you said, that we've ever been. Yeah. So well, it, is it okay if I get into some of the statistics? It might yes, be helpful. please. Yes. Okay. So um, maybe just to contextualize this, porn is the three A's. It is affordable accessible and anonymous mm. and those three together are what are making it a widespread what i would call like a silent epidemic in our society um in the time it takes for me to just say the sentence the porn industry makes roughly 10 grand us um it it has more annual revenue than the nba mlb nfl combined wow. year over year um there's estimated about 40 million um people that watch um Pornhub, which is the world's largest porn site uh, in America alone um, on a regular or semi-regular basis. Um, so that's over 10% of the American population, but that's just the regularity. Um, then you have m much more. Um, in some surveys, the surveys are a lot harder because um, I would say that it's not that the data is unreliable, but you have to take it more with a grain of salt. But there are surveys that would suggest like in a church, uh, you know, church on a typical Sunday morning, anywhere from 50 to 60% of those men have watched porn in the last month. Um, so like there are surveys showing that uh, with pastors, the viewership is reported to be lower, like anywhere from 20 to 40%. 
but still pretty regular. And the reason these surveys you have to take with a grain of salt is because we presume that they were fully honest in the surveys. And we don't always know if that's the case because for some guys, if they're honest about that, they might risk losing their job. So, you know, there's just, there's different elements here. Um, the other thing that's worth noting, um, and I'm just, I'm very adamant about getting this, this information across, um, is that when porn is involved in a marriage, the rates of divorce increase by 56%. Oh my gosh. And so one of the big lies that people are believing is that, oh, I, I know I shouldn't watch porn, but at least it only affects me. That's so untrue. And a stat like that hopefully should reveal just how destructive it can be to the people in your life, whether you're married or not. It clearly impacts how we interact with other people. Um, and that's not even touching on the the sex trafficking and the horrible conditions these videos are uh, filmed in and some of the other things that go with that where it's like very dehumanizing. You'd, you'd be mortified to hear some of the stuff that goes on on the other side of the screen. Um, and the last thing is that for every two guys that are watching pornography, there's a woman watching. So this is no longer uh, a male only issue. Women are struggling and it's an added layer of shame that they have to hurdle because of it, because people have kind of categorized this as a male issue. So, um, yeah. So if, if you dig into the stats, you see that this is actually, this is pretty significant and pretty dramatic. And I, I want to say something about the loneliness as well, but I'll let you comment on the stats first. because yeah, You look I, like you got something to say. I, I have a question. The, I lo- I, I'm really excited about this. This gray area of what is porn? What do you consider porn? It's a great question. I mean, it's that is such a hard question because even um, this would be another stat. So um, what is considered softcore pornography today, like 10 years ago, would have been considered hardcore. So the goalposts are moving all the time to like what's inappropriate or what's not. Um to use like more biblical terms, you know, the Greek word for like sexual sin, lust and all that is a, is a word called porneia. So very obvious uh, association there. And I think I, I would say what constitutes pornography or at least what we're talking about today, I like to broaden it to sexual misbehavior. It is anything that is outside of what we would constitute a sexual healthy behavior. And to me, like the, the healthiest form of sexual behavior is always going to be, be between a husband and a wife in the confines of marriage. Um, and so I think anything that that goes outside of that to me is where it starts to encroach on sexual misbehavior, whether that's, um, you know, like looking at an Instagram model just a little bit too long, whether that's masturbating on your own or whether that's like full on you're hiring prostitutes, as, escorts and having affairs. Um, I think all of that would be in the category of sexual misbehavior. And obviously those have varying degrees of ramifications, but to me, they're all basically outside of the confines of what I would constitute as healthy sexual behavior. That's a really good definition. Thank you. I, I think that there's, we justify, right? Oh, yeah. It's really easy. Like, well, I'm, I'm watching Netflix with my wife and there's some side boob. Like it's not a big deal. Yeah. Like again, I think it's, I think I always know inside like what's right and wrong. Like you have this compass, right? Of like, eh, this is a slippery slope that can go nowhere good. Mm-hmm. And it's for some, it might be different. I don't know. It's, it's probably a tough one. Like you said, the goalposts are constantly moving because on Instagram, if you were to look at my, if you hit the, the circle, right. And it shows pops up, there's all the stuff I'm interested in, which is horses and outdoors and some hunting stuff and a lot of car stuff and truck stuff. But every fourth thing. Yeah. There's someone in there shaking their butt. Yeah. 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 A hundred percent. You can't get away from it. No. And I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. If I'm being honest, like there, there was a, uh, a study that showed that about 80% of, of like mainstream pornography, 80% of like the most commonly watched videos in porn uh, depicted scenes of violence ag- and aggression. Really? And um, yeah, so like this kind of stuff is becoming mainstream. That's obviously on the actual porn sites, not on Instagram. But even Instagram, like that's a great example because the what a lot of the the porn industry does is uh, remember they're they're a, por- a for profit industry. So what makes a company more profitable? Well, longevity of their clients. So it's not just it's not just that they want you on their website longer. It's that they want you to keep coming back to their website for. Uh, uh, you know, as, as much of your life as possible, which is why children actually get targeted in by tons of the the porn industry. Whether it's if it's not to participate in their videos, there's some really dark stuff that happens on that front. Um, then it's it's just to uh, to get them viewing the content because they know that if they start watching 
young, you know, early, there's a much greater chance that they will be with them long term and be a more profitable customer, quote unquote. So there's there's layers to this thing. But all this to say is like, yeah, it's it's just better to not play with fire because like you said, it's a very slippery slope. Yeah. Um, I also would like to circle back. I mean, there's so much here. This is such a loaded conversation, but let's talk about the void of intimacy. Let's so the scenario is you're married and you look at porn and like you said, it's 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 only affecting me. Yeah. Like there's this huge blind spot that I think in the in our hearts and the way that we're wired to be connected to our wives. And again, we're talking about married people right mm-hmm. now that it affects subconsciously spiritually emotionally it's 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 robbing us of real intimacy and we don't even know it right yeah can you speak to that a little bit yeah i, I would love to so i think um the our, our working definition i don't know i'm sure you've heard this before as well for intimacy is into me see right so it's it's that idea of just like steady transparency and i think what happens with pornography is pornography kind of gives you this uh illusion sort of the fake sense of intimacy and um if you really dig into it, like when people start to say like, oh, it only affects me, it doesn't affect anyone else. People will say that not only to justify pornography, but even like compulsive or chronic masturbation. And these activities are ultimately solo intimacy, right? And that's that's the actual issue is that you're experiencing intimacy in a oxymoronic way because solo intimacy doesn't actually make, there's no such thing. That doesn't make sense. You can't have intimacy without another person involved. And when you try to circumvent that system or you try to bypass it, it, it inevitably, it begins to rewire just even at a biochemical level, it's going to start to rewire your brain and your body for how they experience connection mm. with another person. On an emotional level, you see that people start to, you know, they start to close up. Um, the woman can always tell that he's hiding but every time i ask i'm not really getting much or whenever we try to talk a bit more deeply he just like there's a wall there so the the relationship starts to erode or they hit a ceiling and uh you know i had a guy sign up this week who's like yeah my marriage is uh, my marriage is actually pretty good um you know um and i was like oh well does she know about this oh no no i could never tell her and it's like well how good could your marriage be if you have this hidden in your life exactly. like we're living under a lie here but but based on his ceiling he's like well yeah my marriage is pretty good but it's like bro your ceiling is so low you don't even realize how much better your marriage could be but that's just on the emotional relational side it's probably worth mentioning really quick jeremy that there's a physical component to this as well so um let, let, this is one last one last stat i won't bombard your audience too much here but in 2001, the rate of erectile dysfunction among men under the age of 40 was 5%, which is exactly what you would expect. Like, it's kind of an old man issue. We've all seen the Viagra and Cialis commercials yeah. or whatever, right? So it's 2023 when we're recording this. In 2019, it was reported that the same rate uh, of erectile dysfunction in the same demographic, men under the age of 40, was reported to be as high as 25%. Wow. One in that four. That makes sense. That makes sense four. with the money that's being thrown at these ads about it. Hundred percent. Right? So what's happening? Just so people get an idea and why this is so false that it's like, oh, it doesn't really affect anyone. It only affects me. Well, um, if you condition your brain long enough to experience arousal from pornography, pornography is what they call a supernormal stimulus. It is unnatural levels of stimulation to your brain and your body, and your body starts to set a new threshold for what it what is required for it to experience arousal. And if that threshold is higher than what you normally experience when you have physical intimacy with another human, then you will experience erectile dysfunction. You'll experience disconnection during sex. And you can just imagine how this starts to erode the quality of someone's life, let alone their relationships and everything else that comes with it. So there's there's some major implications here for any kind of sexual misbehavior, whether it's um, it's just innocent scrolling, looking at a, an Instagram model and getting your little hit that way, or it is something in the more you know overt sexual misbehaviors. The the effects are widespread, whether you like it or not. Yeah, I mean it's it's really cancer, right? And it's mm-hmm. varying levels of it, but it does it does it does rob intimacy in how it was created to be between a husband and a wife. Mm-hmm. And the shame aspect of it, it's 
It's crippling. Yeah. It's crippling. And you pull back from your wife, you know, because of the shame. And it's really so much of it though is, is subconscious, right? Like if Mm -hmm. without you bringing awareness to this, you don't recognize the ramifications of porn at whatever level you're consuming it, but it, but it is showing up in your relationship. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and it's subconscious. And that's what I think people don't realize. Yes. Right? And, and if your <laughs> partner is not aware, then your relationship is a ticking time bomb because when you're in a relationship and you have hidden sexual misbehavior, there's only two options. You either confess or you get caught. There's, there's no other way out of it. Mm-hmm. And whatever you fear, if, if you're like, no, I could never confess because you know, she's going to leave me and I'm going to lose the kids and our marriage will never be the same. All the stuff that you fear has a very low probability if you confess. But if you get caught, the chances of those things is way higher. And unfortunately, oh, a lot of guys come to us when they've been caught. And it's a much, again, like we see God do incredible things, um, but it's a much steeper climb back to that place of health and restoration. And so if, uh, you know, just while we're on this subject, if there's one thing I can implore your audience to do if they're in this position is confess it, like start to have those conversations. Um, and uh, we can give some resources at the end to help them do that as yeah, well. Yeah, for sure. Um, Cause there's, there's certainly some good protocol to this, but yeah, it's, it's a must. You, you have to get that out there in your relationships. Could I suggest a step to that Please. is what we're seeing around the fires is confess it to your brothers and let them be a soft landing spot yes. for it. Yes. And to let a place of compassion come in to that place that you're, cause most guys that have some awareness of it and feel some conviction will say it's painful. Yeah. It's painful, and you've there's a lot of, of self hatred involved in this journey. Yeah, I think for most men, oh, yeah. if they're honest with themselves, and we're just seeing so much healing, the birthplace of it being again around a group of men that you trust and know that it's not leaving these walls. Yep, around a fire, and and if and I get that this is very specific to what we're doing, but go have a cup of coffee with that one dude that you trust, and be like, hey man. I'm dealing with something and I don't know. I think there's something about having that safe landing spot and, and receiving some validation and, and, and giving yourself some compassion and like before you just try to go tell your wife, because that seems too daunting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That might seem like there's like you just said with your clients, like there's no way, (laughs) no way I can tell, but they might have a buddy. They might have a trusted friend that they could take this to. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that to have maybe a stepping stone to get to the, the oh, life I, part. But Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because, um, yeah, I mean, we probably don't have time to go through it today. Uh, but like I said, I, I do have a resource that um, we can give about this. But like yeah. it, uh, yeah, guys just mess this up so many different ways. And I think I think even just having a conversation with someone else first is a great way for you to just air it out a little bit and, you know, probably do some processing while you're talking it through. Um, it can really refine it a little bit so that you can have a much healthier conversation with your wife about it. So yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, and it's why this this loneliness thing is huge. And maybe to tie this all together, you know, because the the loneliness thing, like when we when we start to dig into, let's say somebody has a, a, a slip recently and we're asking some questions around it and we're like, okay, what were what was the environment you were in? What were some of the things you were feeling? I mean, six, seven times out of 10, they were feeling lonely. They were feeling mm-hmm. alone. And it's not it's not because they're isolated, right? There's a difference between being alone where it's like you're physically isolated, you're the only person in a room, and being lonely where you're in a crowd of people but you feel like you're the only person in a room. And um, and that's becoming a widespread thing. And I think like you're saying, like if you talk to a guy, you're not only you're not only getting rid of the shame and you're not only giving yourself a chance to actually confess it and and process it a little bit, you're combating some of that loneliness that's probably contributing to your problem in the first place. Yeah, that's that's super good. What happened right before what you wanted to have happened happened. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yes. I mean, that's a lot, but like that's where we need to go to get to the source of this unprocessed pain that's showing up and the the counterfeit to intimacy is is porn, right? I mean, it's 
it's the it's the counterfeit version of what we're we're our souls longing for yeah and and what we're craving and and it's like you said i can you say that again the three letters that it makes it so yeah powerful? yeah it's that was affo- good affordable accessible and anonymous yeah yeah wow and, and you can just stay hidden in it Exactly. Well, I think that's what delineates it a little bit from alcoholism and not that it's about comparing them, but like um, all all addictions have the three A's in varying degrees. I think just porn addiction seems to have them in like intense levels, you know, in all three yeah. categories. And um, yeah, the, the anonymity of it is a huge one, like because you it can start so young that's the problem right is like mm-hmm. a 12 year old alcoholic i mean I don't, I don't know if there is such a thing but if there is like that 12 year old gets found out pretty quickly cuz you can observe it in their behavior their development's going to be affected um, you can smell it you, you can, can smell see, like, it it's, yeah it's such a different sneaky yeah it's just not the same with pornography man. yeah it's really an undercover like you can take it to work with you you can take this addiction yes or this this thing with you anywhere yes yeah literally literally anywhere yeah and that and and for a long time you know people learn to wow. to function with it and um yeah. cover it up pretty nicely well that's so good man i really appreciate you i mean you really have got a gift in explaining this and you break it down in terms that dudes like me can understand and that's why you're so powerful in this lane and it's such an honor to have you on. I I do want to encourage everyone um, to go check you out. And I want to give you all the time and space you need to. How can we get connected with you? I have, I, I love this connection and resource. I want to send guys your way that reach out and bro, I love what you're doing and we need it. We, we need people like you that understand this and have been through it and have this gift to give it away. We always say you can't give away what you don't have. Mm, yeah. And you 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 have hope in this area and in in such a large capacity to give it away and I just appreciate you coming on today and sharing that. So how what are some of the resources where guys can find you? Yeah, so uh so very simple. Um I have a daily podcast called Unleash the Man Within. I'd love your listeners to go check that out. Um yes. and if they type in like uh wife or disclosure, uh we we've, we've done a bunch of episodes on how to really handle this process well. If you uh, like I said, if you if your listeners want a resource to help them in this particular area, but I mean, we're about to pass 500 episodes, so pretty much any subject you can imagine in this arena we've covered, we've covered yeah. in some capacity. Wow. And so it's called Unleash the Man Within. It's available on all major platforms um and if people want to uh want another way for daily content maybe they're like okay i'm not giving up the social media thing but i know it's a problem we're very active on instagram as well daily content there and um we can put the handle in the show notes i have a hard name it's it's Sathya me sam it's s-a-t-h-i-y-a-m-e-s-a-m um but uh but yeah that would be another place and we have probably 250 to 300 conversations a day answering questions talking to people um trying to resource them and doing everything we can to just be a support because um there's still not a lot of great resources out there so we're just trying to trying to shine a light and trying to make everything as accessible as possible so those would be the two ways unleash the man within the podcast and i'm Sathya me sam on instagram that's amazing. Yeah, guys, we'll have all this in the show notes. So you should be able to just click on it and go straight and find this wonderful man who's doing amazing work. What an honor to lock arms with you today and in this journey of um, men getting healthy and whole in, in all aspects and areas of life. And the work you're doing is incredible and so important. I don't know of a more worthy cause and thank you so much for your time and coming on here today and blessing us with what you fought for and fought through and your wisdom and knowledge in this area is unbelievable. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. Thanks for what you're doing, Jeremy, as well. I think we're definitely uh, we're on the same mission here to just help men live better lives and be more like the people God made them to be. And I love what you're doing, too, man. So it was a, it was a privilege to be here. Yeah, we got to get you to Idaho to retreat. It'd be, oh, be I would so love that. cool to yeah. get you out here and be a part of what we're doing in, the, in this cabin up in the mountains. So That'd be fun, man. Let's do it. Awesome, bro. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. Adios.